Thanks for joining another edition of the Blue Chip Partners Quarterly Edge. For those of you who I have not spoken to in the past, my name is Daniel Ducina. I'm the Chief Investment Officer here at Blue Chip Partners. So agenda for today, same as usual. I'll walk through what I view as three of the pertinent themes for the upcoming quarter. Although given this is the first quarter of 2024, the outlook that I put forth can be almost interpreted as a 2024 outlook in general instead of just the first quarter. Um, and just as in quarters past, we'll look at one theme that relates to the overall domestic economy. We will look at what I view as pertinent points for the domestic equity market. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about fixed income to round things out. So on the headline, starting with the economy, I'll jump into further details on all these, but just to give you a, a brief overview, uh, the general thought process, I would say from my seat, is that this year in the economy in the US, I do expect a general level of slowness to start to emerge. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we're not going to experience growth at all. Uh, realistically, I do think that this is already anticipated broadly. Uh, it's anticipated by investors, it's anticipated by the Federal Reserve, and specifically, the reasons that I'm citing a level of slowness in the U.S. economy relates back to the labor market, and it relates to a slower level of consumer spending. In the equity market, 2023 really was embodied by one of the most narrow equity markets from a return perspective that we have seen going all the way back to 1998. Um, and the, the short answer here for what we think in 2024 is that we think there will be a broadening out of equity returns. Um, we do think that the risk versus reward construct is, is skewed in favor of some of those that were left behind in last year's rally. And just as we touched on last quarter uh, in the equity portion of the quarterly edge, in the slowdown phase of the economic cycle, if that does come to fruition as we are expecting, there are certain types of companies that perform relatively better than others. And that those types of companies just so happen to be those with very strong balance sheets, and that are aggressively returning cash to shareholders. So we do think of broadening out and those high quality companies should work very well in 2024. And then finally, on the fixed income side of the equation, we continue to believe that the higher quality subset of the bond market offers a tremendous value proposition right now. Even after a fairly stark rally in bonds over the course of the final two months of 2023, you still have yields in the higher quality subset of the fixed income market that are above where they were, where they have been 70% of the time over the last 20 years. So realistically, the opportunity is still there. And for just taking on a marginal amount more risk relative to a money market fund type exposure, you do get attractive coupon payments and you're getting the benefit of potential price appreciation as well. So I'll dive into the economy section first. Uh, feel free to fire in questions using the uh, Q&A functionality in the GoToWebinar app, however you're joining. I will address any questions that come in at the end. So more specifically in terms of why I'm anticipating a slower economic growth environment in 2024, um, again, I mentioned this is a lot to do with the labor market to start. Um, if you look back through the course of 2023, one thing we were very encouraged by was the fact that the supply and demand dynamics in the labor market got back into balance. Um, coming out of the pandemic, you had an immense amount of, of, of corporations and small businesses that were trying to fill jobs and were unable to, and that resulted in individuals getting paid a significant amount more, and that could stoke inflation, just as we saw. Um, Looking at 2023 in particular, we saw a lower level of job openings. We saw just a general level of slowness emerging in terms of the monthly jobs actually being added to the economy. And, you know, just as a result of those lower job openings, less people looking to hire, we saw wage growth starting to slow down a little bit year over year as well. And that's coming off of a very aggressive period, that inflationary period. So all of this is, is healthy. This is bound to happen in an economic cycle, but all we want to make sure doesn't happen is that we don't overshoot to the downside. So the Federal Reserve, you've heard talks of them starting to potentially become more stimulative in 2024. I think they're turning their focus from the inflation side of their mandate to the labor side of their mandate. Because uh, realistically, I think that 2024 is going to be a year where the labor market is, is very much in focus. And so if you do start to have additional softness start to emerge on the jobs front, 
Um, I think that ultimately that's going to be somewhat problematic in terms of stoking additional fuel for the economy um, going forward. So if we do get this kind of softness in the labor market, that does have an impact on the consumer as well, obviously. Uh, and recently, if you look at the, the bulk of consumer spending that has kind of exploded over the last two and a half years, a lot of that has actually been driven by savings that were pent up over and above you know, the traditional kind of trajectory throughout the post-pandemic period and the, the stimulative actions that were provided by the government. Um, and more specifically, you know, put some numbers around that, you can see in this chart that I'm showing on the screen that $2.1 trillion were accumulated over and above the normal trajectory of savings in the U.S. So that savings rate, you know, was, was, was very much above average and individuals were accumulating extra dollars from, you know, call it March 2020 through uh, the middle of 2021. Well, a lot of the spending that's happened over the last two years has been driven not by necessarily extra income. It's really been driven by a drawdown of those excess savings to the tune of about $1.7 trillion. So I guess the point right now is that we find ourselves in a position where the consumers have more or less drawn down all those accumulated excess savings. And so if there is going to be additional call it above trend consumer spending growth, it has to come from extra income because those savings are getting to be very close to depleted. And right now what we see, at least that what we did see for the back half of 2023 is that the level of income was not outpacing spending. So individuals continue to draw on those excess savings. So I guess the assertion that I have is if you have a little bit of a, a slower labor market, and you have individuals that have drawn down their savings and continue to spend above their income levels, that can only go on for so long. So realistically, either we get higher incomes or we get a softer level of consumer spending. And I would take the latter as being more likely. And now this doesn't mean that we're going to see some sort of collapse in spending. Uh, consumer spending accounts for roughly 70% of US GDP. So Certainly any, any movement in consumer spending is going to be meaningful from an overall economic growth standpoint. I just think that to me, all indications point to a, a relatively softer level of consumer spending as we work towards 2024, as we work through 2024, that is. So not a doomsday scenario. You know, this section is titled slower but not stagnant. I think that's exactly what you're going to get as economic data starts to roll in through, throughout this year. So on the equity side of portfolios, as I mentioned before, 2023 was just an incredibly narrow and incredibly top heavy market. Um, in, an, in an environment where you have the largest companies outperforming, a capitalization weighted index like the S&P 500 that gives a higher allocation to the larger companies, that type of index will perform very well. And the level of concentration that we saw in performance last year, it was fairly historic. Uh, so the chart that you're seeing on the bottom half of the screen right now, it shows the number of constituents, I guess the percentage of constituents in the S&P 500 index that actually outperformed that index in any given calendar year going back to 1990. And you can see that brown line is telling you on average or on median more specifically, um, you get roughly half of the companies in the S&P 500 that outperform the index. The other half underperforms on a median year. Well, the number of companies and the percentage of companies that outperformed the S&P last year was roughly 28%. That's the lowest level of outperformers within the index since 1998. So that's just another way to think about how concentrated the returns actually were in the U.S. equity market. And to have the index up, you know, north of 20% and only have 30% of those companies actually driving uh, a level of outperformance. And more specifically, it was really just seven companies that drove returns. You know, this was just an, an absolute outlier, somewhat of an anomaly. And it's not necessarily something that we would view as indicative of a healthy market or something that we would view as likely to continue. Um, so we do still think selectivity is warranted 
Um, I mentioned that those quality companies tend to perform best in an economic slowdown if that's what we do end up getting as we predict. Um, but we really do see more of a broadening in returns in the equity market in 2024. So just to put some more numbers around how uh, historic, how rare what we actually saw was last, last year was, um, on the left-hand side of the screen, I'm just showing the top 10 holdings, the top 10 by weight, the constituents within the S&P 500 index, their average weight in the index throughout the year, the total return, and the actual contribution that each, each of these 10 companies made to the overall S&P 500 index's return. And the one thing you'll see in terms of the companies highlighted in green, these are your Magnificent Seven. Um, and if you look all the way down at the bottom here, you can see that the average return and this is data through December 20th, not through the end of the year, but very close to it. The average return for these top 10 stocks was you know, close to 80%. Um, and the contribution of these top 10 names, again, the largest weighted names having a high total return, you had a, almost 65% of your return in the S&P 500 that was driven by realistically just seven names. So to have, you know, I would say, almost 15% of your portfolio in two names, which is essentially what would happen if your entire equity allocation was, was just the S&P 500 index. Um, that's just, that's not a risk that I would view as prudent for most individuals. And so in years like last year, when the you know largest companies dominate the market and perform really well, it can work out very well for a portfolio. But um, in years like 2022, you know, being that concentrated in stocks that could have been down 30% or more, you know, that's very challenging for individuals. And keep in mind that even though you had stocks like Meta and Tesla up, you know, monumentally last year, um, they were both down south of 60% in 2022. So realistically, 2023 was just getting back above water um, and they didn't even accomplish that actually. Um, Last thing I'll note is that if you go all the way back to 1990, um, the the outperformance for a capitalization weighted S&P 500 versus an equal weighted S&P 500, um, which essentially the latter of which just gives an equal share to each company in the index. 17 years out of those 34, the cap weighted index is outperformed. 17 years out of 34, the equal weighted is outperformed. So a very even split. And to have a return spread between the two of nearly 13%, aka the S&P 500 traditional cap weighted index outperformed the S&P 500 equal weighted index by almost 13% last year. Again, very, very large, very much an outlier. You have to go all the way back to 1998 to find that level of outperformance for a cap weighted S&P versus an equal weighted S&P. So, Moral of the story here is we just envision a broadening out of equity returns in 2024, um, and we specifically have a preference for those types of companies that perform best in the slowdown phase of the economic cycle. Finally, on the fixed income side, before I get to any questions that have rolled in, um, you know, we have been optimistic on the traditional high quality fixed income subset over the last few quarters. Uh, we think the setup is well from a macro perspective. We think the Federal Reserve potentially becoming more stimulative certainly bodes well for bond prices. Uh, what you saw in the last two months of 2023 really was kind of an indication of what you will likely see in the bond market if we do get more um, assuredness from the Federal Reserve in terms of rate cuts and more stimulation. Um, but realistically, the question that we were getting, you know, through the end of last year and as we've started the first couple of weeks here, you know, with the way that bond prices have moved and the way that yields kind of came down dramatically over the last two months of last year, you know, did I miss the boat? Am I too late? Um, and my answer to that, that question is no, you're not, because realistically, you still are getting paid in these very high quality fixed income instruments. So I'm talking about U.S. Treasuries, investment grade corporate bonds and municipal bonds. You're still getting paid a coupon level that, again, is above where those securities have been yielding 70 percent of the time over the last 20 years. Um, in the case of U.S. Treasuries, you know, 84 percent of the time over the last 20 years. 
Um, so you're still getting compensated at a well above average rate. Um, and you know, if you do get this environment where yields are going to start being pressured to the downside, you can get price appreciation out of these securities as well, because these securities become a lot more attractive if rates start to move down. You've already got locked in higher rates. So realistically, I think that the, the proposition is not necessarily to, to take money out of your equity exposure and shift it into fixed income. That's not necessarily what I'm recommending. But what I am recommending is that individuals start to think about pairing back um, what have become fairly large money market exposures. Uh, money market funds you know, can be great, uh, especially when the rates are as high as they are and as high as they have been. Uh, but realistically, you know, if you look back at the month of November in the bond market, you know, municipal bonds in the U.S. essentially gave you the entire year of money market return in just one month. Municipal bonds were up north of 6%. Um, so I guess the, the value proposition that you get from money market funds is stability, um, you know, consistent income. You can get those same elements from the traditional bond market subset, treasuries, investment grade corporates, and municipal bonds. But again, you're also getting the benefit of potential price appreciation as well. Um, so realistically, I think it's it's more about pairing back those money market allocations and taking advantage of some of these high yields that are available in, in high quality instruments today. So still remain optimistic on, uh, on the traditional fixed income subset. So I'm going to take a look at uh, any of the questions that have rolled in right now. First question I have is how many interest rate reductions are priced into mid slash long term bonds? Well, what I would say is I haven't looked at the numbers over the last two days because uh, strangely enough, our Bloomberg terminal had a bit of a malfunction the other day. But what I can say is that at the end of last week, uh, Fed funds futures were pricing in seven rate cuts for 2024. Um, that's not necessarily what the actual bond market is pricing in because the bond market, um, you know, with a 10 year treasury around 4.1%, that doesn't imply seven rate cuts. But I do think it's somewhere between the, the zero and seven that is currently priced in by the Fed funds futures. So realistically, I don't think you have to get seven rate cuts for bonds to be attractive right now. Technically, you don't have to get any rate cuts for bonds to be attractive right now. I think a more realistic scenario and kind of where the bond market is at right now is closer to three rate cuts, potentially four, depending on how economic data starts to develop over the next couple of months. Um, and I think that's a pretty fair assessment. So you're still getting value in bonds right now. And I would say you are in a bit of a situation for bonds where bad economic news is good news because bad economic news, whether it's bad manufacturing data, bad employment data, um, or you know anything of the sort that can be interpreted as generally bad news for the economy, will actually be interpreted as good news for the bond market because if there's bad news for the economy, that means the Federal Reserve will likely have to be more stimulative, and that means lower yields, and that means higher prices for existing bonds. Uh, another question, I think interest rate reduction expectations are built into home builder stocks, but will there be a time this year to get into builder stocks like uh, Horton, Toll Brothers, et cetera? So DR Horton, Toll Brothers. Um, you know, I, this is a challenging one because home builders, you know, they had a, a fairly significant run. And I think the what folks are wrestling with right now obviously has been the fact that you've kind of got competing forces at play. So yes, the more like short term recent focus has been challenging for the housing market just based on where interest rates have been. But at the same time, you still have this secular demand for homes from millennials who are now the largest demographic in the US, but are historically underrepresented from a home ownership perspective. So you have this secular demand that is, is, is still there, but you know, when does that start to really come online? I think a big part of it for the home builders is actually getting um, a bigger offering base because historically the home builders haven't really focused on building starter homes. They can make more money on that kind of 2,500 square foot house instead of the, you know, 15 to 2,000 square, square foot house. So I think that um, that ultimately is a really big opportunity for home builders. And in terms of timing, um, you know, 
I would say that I haven't done the valuation work on them specifically, but even if there are, I would have a hard time believing that there are more than three or four rate cuts that would be priced into home builders right now. So if you do get an expectation or indication, like I said before, of more significant economic deterioration than is currently expected, then I think that actually would could end up being a reasonable time to look at home builders. It sounds kind of counterintuitive because if you think, yes, the economy is slowing down, people have less money to spend, all that. Realistically, the individuals that will be buying a home, um, a lot of them will probably have that money locked up in very safe instruments. So some deterioration economically might not make a, a humongous difference for them. Um, so it's tough to say because we don't necessarily follow the home builders uh, that closely just because they don't necessarily screen super well from a quality perspective for us, um, just given some of the dynamics that, that go on within their business. But, you know, I do think there could be a time this year where you get uh, a good entry point on them, especially if people overreact to, uh, to um, you know, potentially hotter economic data. So that's all the questions I'm seeing. I'll give you guys one last chance to uh, fire anything in before I uh, give you a few minutes back here. Well, I'm seeing nothing, so uh, I will just take this time to round things out and thank you all for attending another edition of the Blue Chip Partners Quarterly Edge. Uh, be sure to follow us on LinkedIn, stay up to date on our website via our blog for all the most recent happenings at Blue Chip and recent perspectives on the market and financial planning. You can also download a full copy of my quarterly outlook, the topics we covered in the Quarterly Edge today through the website if you go into the resources section and click on the blog. Thanks again for joining guys and I will talk to you again soon.